So building on the information lifecycle, what we have here are the usual suspects who produce information. And you know, if you boil it down really hard, there are only five usual suspects that you have to think about. Sources, people or organizations or entities that, are, that may provide you the answer to your question or may provide you the knowledge you need to write your paper or get the good grades. Firstly, you have governments. Governments compile a lot of statistics. Governments are responsible for different areas of business and society. So you have to think about, you can, you can actually get a lot of information from government websites, right? So for example, anything that, ha that you have to get a permit from somebody from the city or from the federal government or the provincial government, chances are that they're compiling statistics on a yearly basis every couple of years to assess how the companies who are getting those permits are working for society. For example, daycares are a provincial uh, regulated entity. So you can look at the provincial government of Quebec to get a lot of information about the business of daycares. Restaurants uh, have to get permits from the city of Montreal. So maybe the city of Montreal has something to say about restaurants. Um, radio stations, TV stations, airlines are all regulated by the federal government, different agencies in the federal government, of the government of Canada. So if you can find those government agencies, then it makes sense to, uh, to look at uh, what kind of reports or information that you can, uh, you can find from that. So governments are a cool part of, um, of the information seeking process. Now you'll notice on the handout that there's a little number next to governments. It says 4.1. That refers to a section later in the, in the guide where I tell you, where I teach you how to use that for research purposes, okay? So you go to section 4.1 to find information about governments. And we'll get to that in a second, but I just wanted to highlight that. Now, another usual suspect who produces information, who pr that produce information, are trade associations and lobby groups. Now, you know, there, there's a lot of them out there, but they're not very well used by business students. And I find that unfortunate because there are a lot of really uh, interesting reports that are issued by trade associations, right? We'll get into that in a second. So the idea is that sometimes individual companies want to discuss an issue through a press release or their annual report or different documentation they produce on their website. Other times, they don't necessarily want to get involved directly in the issue, but they're, they're a member of a trade association that does. So it makes sense to go and seek out if there is a trade association for the industry or topic you're interested in and see if they have anything good for you to use. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second as well in, at, at section 4.2 of the, of the handout. Then you have individual companies who are engaged in a market and who may provide you very interesting facts and data, okay? So companies themselves are an important source of information. Now, broadly speaking, there are two types of com companies out there. There are privately held companies and publicly traded companies. Publicly traded have uh, stocks on stock exchanges, right? And because they have access to public capital, they have to disclose financial information. So there's a lot more information available from publicly traded companies than from privately held ones. And if you think about it, anything a corporation tells you, they're either required by law to do it or it's to their advantage, okay? Very rarely would you have a corporation volunteering their trade secrets or you know any kind of private information that they don't really have to tell you. So it becomes hard if you're researching uh, an industry with a lot of privately held companies or a few publicly uh, traded companies that are super big and a whole series of super small ones that are privately held. Yes, I know it's hard, but that's the business world. That's how it works. So in, under, in using information from uh, companies themselves, look at the market leaders. Uh, luckily, you'll find a, a few publicly traded ones. You can get their financial statements. You can access their annual report. You can look at their press releases on their website and, and that kind of stuff. And you can infer from those publicly traded companies a lot of things about the privately held ones, right? And I'll show you some, some tools to fill the gap between the two. Then, at, at this point, that's pretty much the cutoff between what you're likely to find online for free and what you have to pay for, 
right? Because governments have a huge incentive of providing free information on the internet because they want to inform their citizens, they want to engage people in the democratic process. It makes, it makes sense to post a lot of stuff online, right? So governments, you find their stuff on the free web, you use your favorite search engine with a little trick, some tricks, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you my kung fu tricks quickly. It's not that long. Trade associations as well, although some of them do require you to be a member to access their publications. A lot of times you can find some great free information from trade associations on their website. So that's easy to go on the free web. Individual companies as well, particularly publicly traded ones, have a lot of uh, very elaborate websites so you can peruse it and, and find stuff. But then when you, you get into market reports, industry reports from statisticians and analysts, that's where it breaks down because actually what happens is they want to make money from those publications. So you may get an executive summary on the web and they charge you 500 bucks for the rest, right? So the idea is that, you know, you don't have to shell out all that cash as a student because we've actually subscribed to a lot of these sources. Maybe not the ones that you, you wish we had, but we do have a few that you can check out. And what my job is is to make sure that we have enough to cover your needs as a student. So if you feel that we don't have enough, let me know and I'll try to see how I can manage the budget and get some more good stuff. But they get expensive pretty quickly. So um, point being here is that this is where you're probably very likely to hit on good stuff at the library versus not a lot and almost nothing online, right? And I'm going to I'm going to show you extensively the ones that I think are really cool. Okay. And then finally, uh, we have journalists and researchers. Right? So those people who are looking at society and writing about it and providing information and feedback and doing some research about it and writing about it. Okay? And yes, there are a lot of magazines and newspapers online for free, but you may notice that not all of them are online for free. Sometimes you hit a paywall, sometimes you can only click on a few articles every month from a specific magazine or newspaper or journal. Sometimes everything's online for free. Right? So that's, it's a bit of a mix. But I can tell you that our collection for newspapers, magazines, journals, um, scholarly peer-reviewed journals is awesome. Right? So if you, if you think what you need is in, a, is in an article and you're bet, pl placing your bet, you're taking a lot of time in Google to find it, you may not be using your time more efficiently. What I would say is, particularly for your research papers, you should use scholarly, scholarly peer-reviewed articles from scholarly journals, and I'll show you how to do that, and that's where the library has a great collection. You can use Google Scholar if you want for that, that's fine, but Google Scholar will only show you things that exist. If you want to click on the article and download it and read it, you have to make sure that you set up your VPN or you're using Google Scholar on, the, on campus so that the, the publishers of these articles recognize you as a Concordia student and you can download them, right? If you're in Google Scholar and you want to read something and, and, and somebody's asking for money to read it, you don't need to pay because we have services uh, to give you access to that. And even better yet, we probably already paid for access, so you might as well try to look it through the library website, okay? And if you need any help, you can contact the library.